Uh, October the 23rd in 1956, uh, which marked the start of the Hungarian Revolution, uh, really are remarkable for a number of reasons. It was the sharpest episode, these events, they were probably the sharpest episode in what was a very protracted process of the crisis uh, and decline and eventual collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and, of course, they were also a spectacular confirmation of some of the ideas of Leon Trotsky, his theories uh, about the need for political revolution in the Soviet Union. Because this movement in 1956, it was not a movement for the restoration of capitalism. It was a movement for a genuine, democratic, healthy socialist state. And the USSR's response to uh, that revolution was bloody and it was brutal. And, uh, and that response provoked crisis and splits in communist parties all over the world. And this struggle, this movement of uh, workers and young people in Hungary in 1956 does actually make these events a really classic study in the nature and the development of a revolutionary process. So I'll try and deal with all of those things that I've just mentioned in the course, in, in my account, of the revolution, but before we get to the events themselves, it's very important to put all of this in context and understand the Hungarian situation in the run up to 1956. So if we go back to 1918, the end of the First World War brought about the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and obviously the corresponding social and economic turbulence that went with that. And part of that was the carving up of Hungary by the victorious powers from the First World War. And those powers carved up Hungary to the extent that it, the country lost two-thirds of its land and one-third of, uh, of its Hungarian-speaking population. And all of this, as you would imagine, exacerbated the national question, which had been on the agenda in Hungary for a long time already. As early as 1906, in Hungary, the elections, which were very limited, obviously, but they had elections nevertheless, and they were won by parties that were in favour of independence, Hungarian independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. That was in 1906, and that, that, those national aspirations, those demands, were ignored by the emperor, uh, obviously. And the national question, so as, as you can see, the national question developed uh, early and continued to develop after the First World War. And the national question in the Soviet Union as a whole, and particularly in Hungary, uh, played an important part in the crisis of the Soviet Union, in that long process that took place. And it plays a specific role in understanding the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. I'll come back to that later. Going back to 1918 then. A very fragile, after the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a very fragile bourgeois liberal regime was installed in the country in 1918. But that lasted only until 1919, when a revolutionary movement put the Communist Party into power in 1919 in Hungary. Now that Communist Party, under the leadership of Bela Kun, was very young. It had only been formed a year previously, and so it didn't have the experience uh, or the discipline of the Bolshevik party in Russia who had obviously come to power in 1917. But they were inspired by this movement, the revolutionary movement in Hungary uh, took place as, uh, uh, largely as a result of, uh, of this movement in, in Russia. Now against Lenin's advice, Bela Kun's party, Communist Party in Hungary, made some mistakes. Lenin tried to advise them differently, but they nevertheless made some mistakes. For example, forced collectivization uh, of the peasantry in the countryside, which undermined support for the revolution amongst the layer of peasantry. And so the revolution was unable to consolidate itself. And uh, later on that same year, just a few months later, Romanian troops, backed by, uh, backed by French imperialism, smashed through the lines, the, the lines of the Hungarian Red Army. They made it to Budapest, sacked the, the capital city, and ejected the Communist Party from power. And this was, this was still in 19, so the Communist Party came to power and was out of power within the space of just a few months. And by the end of 1919, as a result of these experiences, 
conditions had really been prepared for counter-revolution in the country. And that counter-revolution was led by a former imperial admiral, a guy called Horthy. Now, Horthy gained power and he held on to power in uh, late 1919 and onwards on the basis of uh, a bloody and brutal white terror. He allied the country with Hitler during the Second World War. He participated in the Holocaust and in the invasion of the Soviet Union. This was the nature of the Horthy regime in Hungary. And this, of course, was a very harsh lesson for the masses of Hungary because they learned that this regime, this, this white terror, this white Bonapartist reactionary regime of Horthy, was all that Hungarian capitalism had to offer them. There was no kind of cosy centre ground, no nice bourgeois liberal government that could last. The history of the country, ever since 1918, had demonstrated that, uh, that the question facing the people of Hungary was one of socialism or barbarism. That was what uh, these events proved to people. And so this goes some way to explaining why, in 1956, contrary to what the Stalinists said at the time, and contrary, in fact, to what the, what the imperialists, what the Western uh, capitalists said at the time, there was no mood in Hungary for a return to capitalism, because that would have meant a return to landlordism, a return to Horthyism. This was imprinted on the minds of Hungarian people at that time. It was not a movement for a return to those conditions. So at the end of the Second World War, as we know, the Red Army swept across the Eastern Europe. But Stalin, who was obviously head of the Soviet Union at that time, had no interest in establishing a healthy worker's state in places like Hungary, despite the dominance of the Red Army in those places. Because obviously if he had established healthy worker's states in, those, uh, in the Eastern European countries, that would have inspired the masses in Russia itself to re-establish the traditions of Lenin and Trotsky, which would have been a threat to Stalin and his clique. So what they did, the Stalinists at first, they tried to keep Hungary within Russia's sphere of influence, but without touching the capitalist system. They tried to maintain capitalism in Eastern Europe at first. They even, the Stalinists even formed a kind of sham coalition, a pretend coalition with a capitalist party in Hungary for a short time in the first few years after the war. But this, this, uh, this method, this, this idea proved impossible because the fact was that the landlords and the capitalists, the vast majority of them, had retreated with the Nazis in the face of the advancing Red Army. And so uh, trying to form a coalition with the capitalist parties was, was like trying to form a coalition with nothing. It was like grasping at smoke. There was nothing really there. Capitalism had, of its own accord, collapsed in Hungary. And uh, eventually, the Stalinists obviously had to accept this. So next, they began to turn Hungary into a miniature version of the USSR, complete with a bureaucratically controlled planned economy, no workers' democracy, and a very brutal secret police, the ABO. And in addition to that, whilst Hungary was nominally an independent state, every government department had Soviet advisers uh, Russians who were there to effectively tell the department what to do or to at least clear everything that the, the department was doing and a red telephone which connected them directly to the Kremlin. And, uh, and many of the Hungarian leaders then who, who came to power at this time under, under the Stalinist regime had spent much of the Second World War in Russia itself, in Moscow, being trained up in the schools that they had in Moscow for training up future leaders of communist parties all over, the, uh, all over the Eastern Bloc. So they were very heavily under the control of the Soviet bureaucracy. So there's no doubt, obviously, that the move to a planned economy in Hungary was revolutionary in the sense that the economic foundations were completely changed. Landlordism, private ownership, uh, these kind of things were abolished in place of a centralised planned economy. But this was not a revolution in the sense that we, as Trotskyists, would understand it. In the way that Trotsky talks about a revolution in the history of the Russian Revolution, he says that the defining feature of a revolution is that the masses themselves enter the stage of history and take their lives into their own hands. This is not how the planned economy was established in Hungary at the end of the Second World War. It was done in a bureaucratic, top-down manner. <coughs> 
Now, the early period of the Stalinization of Hungary saw really the systematic pillaging of Hungary and countries all over the Eastern Bloc pillaging of those economies in favour of the USSR. In some cases, entire industries were uprooted and transported to the USSR. <coughs> the overwhelming focus of uh, the planned economy at that time was developing the industrial, Russia's industrial base, basically. Consumer goods were sacrificed in favour of developing heavy industry, heavy machinery, this kind of thing. At the same time as this was taking place, the bureaucratic elite were accumulating massive privileges for themselves. Luxury holiday, houses, luxury holiday homes, limousines, much better food than what was available to ordinary people. Clothing, better housing, all this kind of thing. Now whilst the economy is growing, even maybe not in consumer terms, but in general you look at the statistics, you can feel that the economy is developing. You can overlook inefficiency, bureaucracy, waste, privileges, inequality and this kind of thing. You can tolerate that to a certain extent. And of course, the mockery of Hungarian national independence that was being made by the Stalinists. That could, even that could be tolerated to a certain extent. As long as things seem to be developing, things seem to be, at least on some level, uh, getting better. And of course, uh, don't forget that the Soviets, by a lot of people, the Russians, the Red Army, they were welcomed as liberators in Hungary from the, from the, the Horthy regime. Uh, and the kind of the fascist, the pro-fascist regime that, that was there. So there was a certain amount of breathing space given to the Soviet Union. People tolerated it for a certain amount of time. And of course it is also true, we shouldn't paint uh, a, a caricatured and exaggerated picture, it's also true that advances were made in this period in fields like education, culture, public health. All of these things were improved, there were advances made uh, in the living conditions and the working conditions of women, uh, particularly in the form of things like equal pay, so some socialised childcare. All these things did happen in, uh, in the Soviet Union. These were advances, and so people were able to tolerate the regime to a certain extent. But of course, as Trotsky uh, predicted, as Trotsky explained in his book, The Revolution Betrayed, beneath the surface, the contradictions of bureaucracy and inefficiency that are inherent in, a, in the Stalinist regime, that were inherent in the Stalinist regime, were building up. Trotsky explained that any planned economy needs, needs um, democracy, like a body needs oxygen. And that was lacking. And at a certain point, the conditions of life, like there, would be, there, there were crises, the conditions of life would become intolerable. This is what Trotsky predicted. And so, sure enough, we come to 1953. This was the year that Stalin died. And it was also, uh, this, this Stalin's death coincided with a massive stroke, strike wave and, uh, and street fighting in East Germany. There were riots in major cities all over Czechoslovakia. And there were even strikes and protests in Russia itself. And these were the first indications uh, of the stifle, of the first indications that the contradictions inherent within a, 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 a bureauc bureaucratized, deformed worker state were coming to the surface. So the Soviet bureaucracy it could feel the ground trembling beneath its feet, could feel things beginning to change. And so after a brief power struggle, Khrushchev took power and began a process of thaw in the Soviet, uh, in the Soviet policy, a kind of uh, a slight easing off of the repression that was taking place. He was aiming basically for reform from the top to prevent revolution from below. Now, uh, in Hungary, in 1953, there was already significant industrial turmoil. There was appalling repression by the AVO, the secret police. And, uh, and the hardline Stalinist who was in charge at that time, a guy called Rakosi, he had been in Russia during the Second World War. He had been trained up by the Russians. He was removed as prime minister in 1953 as part of this turn at Khrushchev's new policy of, of thawing out the Moscow policies. Rokosi was summoned to Moscow to be sacked. And actually there's an eyewitness account of the sacking which gives you an indication of how the Moscow bureaucrats were thinking. Khrushchev himself, at this meeting, he said the following to Rokosi. He said, you're decimating your people. You're covered in crimes, he said. If this continues, <coughs> your people will grab their pitchforks and pitch you out of the country. This is what the Soviet bureaucrats were worried about and this is why they sacked Rokosi. They replaced him with a guy called Imre Nagy, 
He was someone who had been in Hungary during the war, so he came from a different background. He was seen, in general, as a liberaliser, and he took over from, uh, from Rakosi. Now, one example of, his, of, of this guy Nagy's liberal credentials, in his first speech as Prime Minister, he spoke in the Hungarian Parliament, and he referred to the population of Hungary in that speech, he referred to the population of Hungary as Hungarians. Now, one, uh, one MP who was there for that speech, there's, a, there's an, an eyewitness account, and he recalls the impact that, that just that word, Hungarians, had. He says, since the liberation, as in since the end of the Second World War, the noun, Hungarian, had been eliminated from the official vocabulary. We no longer belonged to an ethnic group, or at least we didn't acknowledge it. We were Hungarian workers, or the working people of the country, or the Hungarian bastion on the wall of peace, or anything else, but never simply Hungarians. He says, it's difficult to explain, but Nagy's use of that word stunned us and filled us with joy all at the same time. So that gives you an indication of the brutality with which the national question was treated by the Stalinist regime. And that, to a large extent, defined part of the flavour of the 1956 revolution. But Nagy didn't just stop there with these, uh, with these references to Hungarians and so on. He, uh, he proposed that forced collectivisation be abandoned, that political prisoners be released, that the AVO, the secret police, be downgraded in its importance, all these kind of things. For all these reasons, Nagy was basically the first person of a different shade to the kind of Stalinist grey uh, bureaucracy. He was the first person to penetrate that bureaucratic clique. And he was therefore a point of reference for many healthy revolutionary elements in Hungary at that time. But of course, we should recognise now that uh, whilst that basically his liberalising regime was very limited, he was still very much under the control of the Moscow bureaucracy. And you can see evidence of this in the fact that whilst political prisoners were released, many thousands more remained locked up whilst Nagy was, uh, was Prime Minister. So his, his, his liberalising reforms were limited nevertheless. But of course, at the time, it was quite a big, uh, a big thing to be happening. Now, by 1955, the Hungarian economy was in crisis, thanks to all kinds of bureaucratic blunders that are inevitable in uh, a planned economy without workers' democracy. And this was the case even with a reformer like Nagy as Prime Minister. Oil fields were being flooded because of a too rapid rise in production. Houses were being built deliberately below specification, just so that people could meet the production targets. And, uh, and this kind of thing. The economy was, was not in a good state. And so in 1955, Khrushchev uh, changed course, not just in Hungary, all over the place, all over the, the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc. But uh, in Hungary, he could see the ongoing shortcomings of the regime. And he feared as well that if you give the masses a taste of reform, if you ease off a little bit on the repression, they'll begin to demand more. And if they demand more, the Soviet bureaucracy can't grant that without undermining their own position. And so, in April 1955, Nagy was replaced with Rakosi. It was a direct swap from what had happened in 1953. Rakosi was back and Nagy was out. Now, the transparency with, with which Moscow controlled the internal regime of Hungary, it was so obvious what was happening. No democratic control whatsoever. Khrushchev just says, what, says this is going to happen, and that's what happens. And the unexplained and the rapid changes in policy and all the rest of it, this enraged the people of Hungary. Obviously, it enraged the working class. Why can't we have control over our own, uh, over our own state, over our own government? Now, a real turning point then came in February 1956. Because in the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which took place in that month in 1956, Khrushchev, in a closed session, denounced Stalin and denounced Stalin's crimes and pointed out that Stalin was responsible for the gulags, for killing political prisoners, for monstrous repression and all the rest of it. Basically, in doing this, Khrushchev was hoping to shift all the blame for all the problems in the Soviet <coughs> Union onto one man. It's all Stalin's fault. Let's denounce him, and then uh, I won't get any blame myself. Obviously, this is not a Marxist method. An individual in power represents more than just himself. He represents a class or a strata in society. Now, this speech of Khrushchev was not supposed to reach beyond 
the walls of that Congress. It wasn't supposed to go beyond the delegates. But it was leaked into the public domain. And of course, that caused a massive questioning, not only of Stalin himself, but of the whole Stalinist regime, the entire bureaucratic regime in, uh, in Russia and uh, all across the Eastern Bloc. And Hungary, of course, was no exception to this. And the whole country began to bubble with debate and discussion. A group of intellectuals, known as the Potofi Circle, began to meet and they began to discuss the idea of reform of the regime. Now obviously the secret police, the AVO, they infiltrated these, uh, these circles, these discussion circles that were talking about reform. But interestingly, to the horror of their commanders, they came back from these meetings convinced of the need for reform. This is the secret police, the most brutal uh, apparatus that the state had. Went, went to infiltrate meetings to spy on people and came back convinced of, the idea, of their ideas. They even signed a manifesto to that effect, a number of uh, AVA officers, until obviously they were tortured into retracting their signatures. This was the nature of the regime. But really the crisis in the Soviet Union began to really accelerate after Khrushchev's speech in February 56. Because in May 56, Russian tanks and troops were sent into Georgia to crush an uprising sparked off by austerity measures. June 56, in Poznan and Poland, there was a massive strike wave that began there and then spread across the whole country. And obviously, as in every revolutionary or pre-revolutionary situation, the bureaucracy was split over how to, the establishment was split over how to deal with this situation, this developing situation. Some favoured reform of the, of, the, of the Communist Party uh, and uh, or reform of the policies in order to re-establish the credibility of the Communist Party so that it would then be able to control the movement. To a certain extent, this was achieved in, in a place like Poland. Others favoured a much more hardline approach to crushing the movement and crushing all, of, all dissent. But the point is that when, in any situation like this, when the working class gets on the move, when the situation begins to develop, whichever line the ruling class or the bureaucracy take will be wrong. Because nothing really can stand in the way of a movement of that size. So whichever way they turn, they're going to make mistakes and things are going to go badly. So in Hungary, the response was uh, in July 1956 to remove Rakosi once again. He'd only just been put back in the year before, but he was once again removed uh, as leader of the country because he was so hated, so despised by the masses. But rather than replace him with someone like Nagy, who had the respect of the more revolutionary elements, Nagy was demoted even further and another hardliner was put in the place of Rokosi, another Stalinist no different to him. So the point is that by October 1956, you've got a picture of the combustible material for a revolution having been built up over a long period of time with a particular acceleration since February 1956. All that was required then was a spark to set all that material alight. And so we come to the 23rd of October, when a protest was called by students in Budapest. And this protest, although it was called by students, it incorporated wide political demands, which attracted the workers out onto the streets as well. Now these demands included things like the rehabilitation of Nagy as Prime Minister. They wanted him back in power. They said they wanted the election of a new Communist Party leadership by a national congress. They want free elections, freedom of the press, academic freedom, these kind of demands. And in addition to that, contrary to what the Stalinists said at the time, this was not an attempt to undermine the gains of the socialist planned economy. Because in fact one of the demands of this protest was friendship with the USSR, but on an equal basis. That was what they demanded, friendship but on an equal basis. And the national question then, as you can see, was also present, as you would expect. They demanded, for example, the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Hungary, and also that Hungary itself should be allowed to use, make use of its own uranium stocks. Uranium was being exported to, to the Soviet Union. And uh, the other noticeable thing about this demonstration was the internationalism. One of the, one of the main reasons that it was called was explicitly in solidarity with the, with the movement taking place in Poland at that time. Uh, of, uh, of Polish workers and, uh, and so on. So you can see the international, so the idea, the Stalinist uh, slander, this was a kind of uh, reactionary nationalist movement, is not the case. It did have nationalist elements because of the way the Stalinists 
had treated the national question in Hungary, uh, but it was clearly not uh, from a reactionary point of view. Now, this protest on the 23rd of October was peaceful, and it was attended by tens of thousands of unarmed men, women, and children. The first sign of what was to come was a speech on the radio by a guy called Gero, the first secretary of the Communist Party, and he denounced the protesters as agents of imperialism on the radio, he said this. He gave a very inflammatory, provocative speech. Clearly, he completely misread the situation on the ground. In fact, there are even reports of the AVO and the secret police in, a, in, in these kind of states. The secret police is actually much more in touch with the real mood on the ground than the party bureaucrats who are ensconced in their offices miles away. And there are even reports of the AVO officers listening to this speech and tearing their hair out, saying, this is it, we're all going to be killed now. He's completely misjudged the situation, and he's, provo he's going to provoke these people into an armed insurrection. Now, uh, sure enough, as the demonstration gathered in a square outside the Communist Party newspaper's headquarters, uh, some of the AVO officers panicked and shot at the, at the police, uh, sorry, at the demonstrators. Now, what happened next, I've got a quote here, uh, what happened next was reported by a police lieutenant who was on the ground in the square, who was reporting back to the chief of police of Budapest. And, uh, and, and so this explains what happened next after the AVO opened fire. <clears throat> so the quote runs, uh, the lieutenant said, Comrade Kapas Kapaxi, the people have weapons. I asked for complete silence in the room. I thought I'd gone mad. I didn't quite get you. Could you repeat that, Comrade Lieutenant? Sadly, he gave his report. A motorised army detachment had been passing and the soldiers had seen the AVO troops shooting at the crowd and the ensuing panic. In an instant, they were surrounded by angry passers-by who pleaded for weapons to defend ourselves against the murderers in the AVO. The recruits, young peasants, newly arrived from the countryside, didn't take long to react. They knew the cruelty of the AVO and had just witnessed a new example of it. The smoke and powder of the fusillade were still in the air. One soldier, then two, gave guns to members of the crowd. Others followed their example. Absolute silence reigned in my office. My associates stared at me, frozen. By the gravity of my voice and the sweat covering my face, they knew it wasn't joyful news that I was getting. This is the chief of police in Budapest talking. And then he says, call all your men into the station, I said. Barricade the doors and put out the lights. Gives you an idea of, uh, of the power of the working class when they get on the move, right? This enormous state apparatus, this brutal state apparatus melting into thin air. Now, splits in the state, and especially the armed forces, obviously, are the hallmark of any revolutionary situation. But what was remarkable in Hungary on that day, 20, 23rd of October 56, was the lightning speed with which things developed. Within one hour, the crowd went from a peaceful demonstration demanding that a government minister come out and explain what was going on to them, give an explanation. They were angry, they wanted an explanation. Within an hour, they were arming themselves and engaging in street battles with the secret police. By the end of the day then, as you can imagine, revolutionary consciousness was really developing quite rapidly and correspondingly, counter, the counter-revolution was uh, preparing itself and preparing to strike. And so on that same night, the night of the 23rd and the 24th of October, 1956, the USSR invaded Hungary and mobilized its tanks and its troops to put down the revolution. And by dawn, Russian tanks were patrolling the streets of Budapest. What they hoped is that just the presence of these tanks would quell the population, would get everybody to go home and, and things would peter out. On the contrary, the resistance of hung the Hungarian working class, and young people in particular, was absolutely ferocious. They poured into the streets en masse and fought the Soviet soldiers with everything and anything at their disposal. There are reports of 13-year-old children hurling homemade Molotov cocktails at the, uh, at the tanks. All of this, obviously, had a very profound impact on the Soviet troops themselves. Many of these troops had been told by their officers that they were going to put down a fascist uprising. And then they saw 13-year-olds in the streets fighting these troops. That doesn't correspond. A fascist uprising doesn't have tens of thousands of people in the streets fighting with everything they have against advancing troops. 
And so uh, this, this, this obviously had a profound impact on these soldiers. And again, I'm going to quote again from Kapaksi, this uh, Budapest chief of police. Um, one scene that he witnessed from the police station during the invasion. He says, For quite a while we'd been hearing a noise, like that of a storm, punctuated by ringing cries. Suddenly, from the upper windows, we saw an immense crowd arrive on the adjacent street. From where we were, we saw, as the crowd could not, three large Soviet tanks coming from the opposite direction, straight towards the crowd. It was like a nightmare. The tanks arrived on the street. The tank soldiers saw the crowd, and the crowd saw the tanks. They were nose to nose. The tanks stopped and stayed in place. The crowd couldn't stop. It kept coming, swarming around the tanks. A boy pushed his way through the crowd to the first tank and pushed something through the loophole. It wasn't a grenade, but a sheet of paper. It was followed by others. These sheets were tracts in Russian, which started with a citation from Marx. A people that oppresses another cannot itself be free. We counted the minutes. Nothing happened. Then the top of the turret of the lead tank opened a little, and the commander emerged slowly. Then he flung the turret open and perched himself on the top of his tank. Immediately, hands reached out to him. Young people leapt up on the tank. A young girl climbed up and kissed him. Someone handed the commander the Hungarian tricolor, and immediately the flag was affixed to the tank. The crowd erupted in a frantic ovation. The crowd sung the Hungarian national anthem, and at the tops of their voices, they cried, Long live the Soviet army. Yet these were the same people who, 15 minutes earlier, had determinedly chanted, Russians go home. My deputy and I exchanged glances. Although we were soldiers, the theory of our movement bypassed caste, nationality, personal interest and prejudice. A word from Marx, passed through a loophole, was stronger than a tank directed against a crowd. Gives quite a, paints quite a picture, right? That, uh, that this is what, again, that like you see even the, Soviet, even the Soviet troops, not even Hungarian themselves, uh, melted, the, this, this powerful apparatus melted into nothing in the face of the mass movement. And so within a very short space of time, all over, the, all over Budapest, all over the city, the Soviet tanks turned their guns on the AVO secret police and defended the demonstrators against uh, the secret police. Obviously, the invasion had been beaten, and the Soviets were forced to withdraw uh, from that first invasion. Now, in the days that followed, under the pressure of the developing situation, the workers and the peasants began to move instinctively towards workers' control and democracy all throughout the country. So committees of workers were set up in every town and city. And these committees, they called themselves national committees or revolutionary committees. They didn't call themselves Soviets because the Soviet Union had, made, had soiled that word. But in reality, they were Soviets. And the revolution then swept from the towns into the countryside. The hated forced cooperatives were broken up, and the incompetent bureaucrats who knew nothing about agriculture were kicked out. The peasants organized themselves to send food to Budapest, which was distributed free to help the revolution. Truckloads of food coming in from the countryside, provided by the peasants to support the revolution. And despite the dismantling of the collective farms, resolutions were passed all over the countryside that said that farmers would never accept the return of capitalism and landlordism. So again, you can see the real nature of this movement. The radio station in Budapest was requisitioned by the workers to broadcast their demands and the news of their revolution to the whole world. Newspapers sprung up everywhere. There were previously six newspapers in Hungary, all of which wrote exactly the same thing, the Stalinist line, basically. And within two days, 25 new newspapers had been established, and they were full with actual news, with real living news of the movement. The prisons were fully open, not, like, not partially open, like under Nagy in 53, but fully opened. And people who had been assumed dead for years flooded onto the streets, thousands of them. And they discovered, when they opened the prisons, underground passages that spanned the entirety of Budapest, the whole city. There were these underground prisons. And, uh, and they could hear tappings. Even in the deepest research, they could hear people tapping. And they couldn't find their way to them. That was the extent of the maze of these prisons underneath. 
And some people, they were never released because the counter-revolution struck before they, could, uh, before they could get out. But for a full week, for slightly more than a week actually, power lay with the workers and with their revolutionary committees, not just in Budapest, but all over the country. The government itself, the official government, the Nagy, well, the, I'll come to that in a moment, but the government was attacking its own people at Moscow's bidding. These committees were seen as the only legitimate real organs of government. And uh, what's more, of course, they were the only real armed force in the government. The state couldn't rely on its own troops anymore. So, uh, so all power really did lie with these committees. The committees were demanding that workers' councils in the workplaces be given full control of production, that wages be increased and wage differentials be capped, that a rapid program of house building be undertaken. Basically, a vision of a genuinely socialist society in the space of a week formed itself, was forming itself in people's minds. Now, Nagy himself had been reinstated as Prime Minister, belatedly, on the 25th of October, two days after this, the, the, the very start of the revolution. On the 25th, Nagy was reinstated as Prime Minister. Frankly, it was too little too late. Because uh, with the Revolutionary Committees taking control, and the AVO still repressing, uh, repressing people, even under Nagy's uh, leadership, that government, that Nagy government, had no role to play. No one was looking towards it. It had no base of support. It was suspended in midair. It represented nobody but, but itself. Now, it's true, of course, that the revolutionary process was not an even one. It was full of contradiction. There were pro-capitalist elements, even, who were present in some of the movements. There were CIA-trained operatives who had been elsewhere. They hadn't been in Hungary. They were funded and trained by the CIA. A couple of thousand of them were sent in to try and take advantage of the situation. The Catholic Church tried to take advantage of the situation. Of course, there were these very actionary elements. There were some anarchist elements. There were some very confused elements. And naturally, at the time, the Stalinists all over the world seized on those isolated examples uh, to, to, to tar the whole revolution with the brush of these, of these individuals or these small groups and say, this is a reactionary regime. They referred to it, the Stalinists at the time referred to it as the Hungarian uprising of 1956. They refused to call it a revolution, when in fact a revolution is exactly what it was. But there's nothing Marxist about that method of analysis taking isolated examples and ripping them out of context. We have to view the process as a whole and its direction of travel. And that was clearly towards a uh, democratic, healthy, socialist regime. Today, in Hungary, the revolution is actually claimed by the right wing in this way. Many, the, the, the dominant force in Hungary, or the dominant political ideas around the revolution, are actually on the right. And it's the right who say, yeah, this was a great anti-communist uh, movement. And so you can find in Hungary today left wing, as a, in reaction to that, there are left wingers in Hungary who don't think much of this revolutionary movement. So were, we be, were, were any of us doing political work in Hungary, we'd have to bear that in mind. It doesn't change our analysis of it, but that is actually, uh, as a result, partly of the Stalinist slanders, uh, the weakness of the left in Hungary today, and uh, obviously the, the history that is put out by the West and the imperialists who have an interest in saying this was a movement for the restoration of capitalism. All this has an impact today in Hungary, which distorts the real picture. Nevertheless, it was a genuinely socialist movement. Now, after the defeat of the first invasion, Nagy and others naively thought that they'd won. They thought that, that was it, that the Soviet Union had been beaten and, uh, and things were going to only get better from there. But Khrushchev and the Soviet bureaucracy, they were not going to give in quite so easily. Because this was a movement that threatened to sweep through the entire Eastern Bloc and even into Russia itself. And so Khrushchev resolved to crush it mercilessly. So, in the middle of the night, two weeks after the revolution started, every city in Hungary, every city, not just Budapest, but every city was surrounded by Soviet tanks. And at four o'clock in the morning, on Sunday the 4th of November, the bombardment of, of every city in Hungary began. Now, this second invasion was again carried out by Soviet troops, but this time from the furthest eastern regions of Russia. These troops had little to no connection with the Hungarian people, in some cases not even a common language. The troops were ordered to stay in their tanks, not to speak to a single civilian in, uh, in the country. Any Soviet uh, troop, any Soviet officer 
who showed any sympathy whatsoever for the Hungarian people was shot. There's an example of a Hungarian uh, tank commander who refused that the Hungarian people were lying in the road to stop the tanks. And this tank commander refused to drive over them, he just drove round them instead. And that tank commander was shot for showing sympathy to the, to the Hungarian people. And these troops, they were told that they were in Berlin. Again, they were told that they were fighting fascists. Every possible measure was taken to prevent a fraternisation along the same lines as, as had happened in the first invasion. It was an absolutely brutal slaughter that took place. And the brutality of this invasion was supposed to smash the revolution in one blow. But the Hungarian workers were not cowed quite so easily. For four days and nights, endlessly, Budapest was bombarded by these tanks. Tanks patrolled the cities during the day and, uh, and they pumped phosphorus into buildings to set them on fire and burn them to the ground. They were firing shells at houses at point-blank range. And in response, the workers of Budapest, the soldiers of Budapest, students, school kids, again, 12, there's reports of 10 to 12 year olds being on the streets and, uh, and to fight the Soviets, and, they, and to fight, they vowed to fight to the bitter end. There was a, a British journalist who was at that time part of the Communist Party in Britain, but as a result of these events, left the Communist Party because he saw what the Soviet Union had done and how it had been distorted by the British Communist Party. But he, he's written a book about these events that he, uh, I'll quote from it, about this, about the, uh, this final battle uh, starting on the 4th of November. He says, the people fought the invaders street by street, step by step, inch by inch. The blazing energy of those 11 days of liberty burned itself out in one last glorious flame. Hungry, sleepless, homeless, the freedom fighters battled with pitifully feeble equipment against the crushingly superior weight of Soviet arms. From windows and from the open streets, they fought with rifles, homemade grenades and Molotov cocktails against T-54 tanks. The people ripped up the street to build barricades, and at night they fought by the light of fires that swept unchecked through block after block. So by the 10th of November, the fighting was over. Nagy was out again, he'd been replaced again, this time by another hardliner called Janos Kadar. The resistance did continue, that wasn't even the end of the fighting was over, but the resistance continued. There was a general strike all over the country, but eventually that too petered out. And by the time the smoke had cleared, tens of thousands of Hungarian workers were dead and countless more were injured. The USSR then tightened its grip on the country, flooded Hungary with Soviet troops, and stationed them there on a permanent basis. And Khrushchev also announced that uh, to resolve the situation in Hungary, he would shut their mouths with goulash, as in provide even more reform from the top, give them enough food that they would never complain again. This was his uh, policy. So it was a kind of carrot and stick approach. Flood the country with troops, but also give them enough food that they won't complain about their living standards and so on. And it was that approach that really formed the basis for the relative stability of the Qadar regime uh, for the years into the future. Now the main conclusion to draw from all these events in October 1956 is that despite its defeat, the revolution proved not in the theories and articles of Trotsky, although we should all read them and obviously they're extremely valuable, but it proved that there was an alternative to Stalinism that was not a return to capitalism. And that was why the bureaucracy had to crush the revolution so mercilessly. And it's also why in doing so, this, the bureaucracy created this crisis for itself in communist parties all over the world. It led to splits and demoralizations in the ranks of communist parties everywhere. Now that revolution, it hardly lasted two weeks. The workers were hardly in power for two weeks, but in that time, the workers went from a first radio broadcast, the first broadcast they put out was a request for the UN to intervene in Hungary to sort things out. Obviously very naive. Um, but their final broadcast was uh, a call for the workers of the world to unite. Shows how quickly consciousness changed and developed. The point is that in a revolutionary situation, every hour of every day can make all the difference. 
and the organised presence in Hungary at that time of a genuinely Marxist leadership, basing itself on the ideas of Lenin and Trotsky, could have accelerated the attempts to spread the revolution across the Eastern Bloc, could have armed the workers politically to prepare for a final showdown with the Soviet bureaucracy and all the rest of it. Unfortunately, as we know, the forces of genuine Marxism were extremely weak all over the world, but especially in the Stalinist states at that time. This, these events, they were just one episode in the crisis of Stalinism in the Soviet Union. The convulsions that shook Russia and its allies in this period were symptoms of, as I said earlier, a fundamental contradiction at the heart of Stalinism, which is that a planned economy cannot survive without workers' democracy. Peter Fryer, that, that journalist who I quoted just now, he, uh, he put it like this. He said, Stalinism is Marxism with the heart cut out, dehumanised, dried, frozen, petrified, rigid, barren. And eventually it was that contradiction then that brought down the Berlin Wall, caused the USSR to collapse. But by that time, as we know, the movement had been derailed, hijacked in some places. Uh, and uh, the traditions of 1956 were smothered by the hollow ideas of, uh, of liberalism and a return to capitalism. I mentioned earlier Trotsky's definition of a revolution, where the masses enter the stage of history and take control of their lives for themselves. And Peter Fryer points out that Marx also defined a revolution, and he said that it's a human protest against an inhuman life. And the Hungarian Revolution fits both those definitions of revolution precisely. So today, we are obviously continuing the struggle of the workers and the young people in Hungary in 1956, who were fighting for genuine socialism. And so we need to learn the lessons that their history teaches us. And above all, we should be really inspired by their dedication to the struggle, by the militancy with which they took it up, and the sacrifice that was eventually required of them.